Hello everyone. This is Mike Howard and I am here with Beverly Howard. We're going to do another Bible study. We are still in the book of Genesis, this time in chapter 24. The title of the lesson is Guidance Needed. And this is a great lesson because we're all of us are looking for God's guidance. We're looking for God's will in our life. We're looking for his direction for what we do, what we say. And uh, this lesson will fit right into our day-to-day -day struggles to do what God's telling us to do. So <clears throat> guidance, the definition. Guidance is information that is aimed at making the right choice, especially as given by someone in authority. So that's a perfect description for when we seek God, he's in authority, we seek his guidance for our lives. Of course, his, his word is a light unto our, a lamp unto our feet. And a light unto our path. A light unto our path. So uh, we're in the right place for his guidance. So guidance is often needed for not only the day-to-day -day decisions that we make, but there are decisions that we make during our life that are, Pretty big. For example, the decision on who to marry uh, if you're married, uh, the decision on which church you should choose to be your home church, selecting a job or maybe even a school, deciding where you want to live. In the case of retired people, we sometimes have that flexibility to, to go and, and be in different places. And then as we get older, especially me, okay, it's time to make decisions about health care choices, uh, decisions about surgeons and doctors and those kinds of things. And sometimes that's, that's, uh, that's a little difficult to do. So the characters in this story, we're going to talk today about Abraham getting or choosing or finding a wife for his son, Isaac. It's a great story. It's a very long chapter. I'm going to try to kind of uh, summarize parts of it because uh, we really don't have that much time to cover the whole thing. Uh, the characters in this story are Abraham, of course, and at this point, he's 140 years old. Sarah has already passed away. Uh, his oldest servant is Eleazar, and we're introduced to Eleazar, I think, in chapter 15, uh, and that's when Abraham is complaining that he doesn't have a son, and he's going to have to give his entire, right. entire inheritance to his servant Eleazar. Well, Eleazar is his oldest servant, and he plays the key role here in this story, and then, of course, there's Isaac. And at this point, Isaac is now 40 years old and not even living in the same place with Abraham. But Abraham is concerned that Isaac, it's time for him, it's past time for Isaac to have a wife. So and then we're going to meet Rebecca, who winds up being uh, Isaac's wife. And at this point, we think she's a teenager now. The Muslims believe she was three years old. That's just not appropriate for the story we're about to read. There's not a three-year-old that can do the things that Rebecca is able to do in this story. So she's probably a teenager. That's the age of most marriageable women during that time. And then a, a kind of a sub-character is a fella named Laban. And Laban is Rebecca's brother. And he's going to come into play in a few weeks when we study about Jacob finding his wife, wives, and they turn out to be Laban's two daughters, uh, Rachel and Leah. So uh, I'll just give him a brief mention here, but we'll get into him a lot more in depth later. So let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> We're going to kick it off in chapter 24, verse 3. Uh, and Abraham is asking his servant, Eleazar, to make an oath that he will not stop until he finds a wife for Isaac. So he says this to his servant, I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will, this is verse uh, three and then verse four, that you will not, okay, the first thing he does is says, do not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom we are living. In other words, I do not want him to marry one of the women that live in the Cana area of Canaan, the seven tribes, the Hittites, etc., of Canaan. He says, but I want you to swear that you will go to my country, back to my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac back there. So he's telling uh, his servant that don't choose a wife for Isaac in the area here. Go back to my family that I left to come, come here from, okay, and find a wife for her there. So take off. So 
Uh, Eleazar asks for a point of clarification here. He says, wow, that's quite an ask here. He says, uh, what if the woman that I find is unwilling to come back with me all the way to this land? You're asking her to leave her family and come all this way, 500 plus miles to a place where she's never been. Shall I then take Isaac back to the country that you came from so that he can make his case or so that he can choose a wife there. So, but Abraham has a very strong response to this. He says, no, absolutely not. Make sure that you do not take Isaac back to that place, Abraham said. And he gives him an explanation. He says, because God has promised me this land as my promised, as our family promised land. He says, the Lord, the God of heaven who brought me out of my father's household, he brought me out of the Ur of Chaldees, he brought me out of that pagan culture and out of my father's household in my native land who spoke to me and promised me on oath saying, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he says, I don't want Isaac to leave. Now, a generation later, uh, Jacob is actually encouraged to leave, but mostly because Esau was threatening to kill him. But in this case, Abraham says, do not allow him to leave the promised land. So he says, however, I've got this promise for you, uh, Eleazar. God is going to give you guidance. The Lord, the God of heaven, he will send his angel before you so that you can get a wife for my son there, from there. So good news is guidance is going to come from God through an angel who's going before Eleazar into uh, the land of Nahor. So uh, remember, uh, you, uh, he can't go back. So if the woman is unwilling to come back to you, then you will be released from this oath of mine. Only, once again, make sure that you do not allow Isaac to go back there. So just making sure, number two, no, two don'ts, okay, with this. Uh, one don't is don't let him marry anybody from Canaan. And second don't is don't let him go back to the family. You go back and find her uh, for him. <clears throat> so now verses uh, nine through 11, the servant took 10 camels, lots of gifts, Lots of gold, lots of jewelry, but a lot of gifts for the family, kind of a dowry kind of thing in reverse. Uh, and he journeyed to the town of Nahor, which we think is the same as Haran. Now, if you'll remember when God called Abraham out of the Ur of Chaldees, they made it all the way up the rivers uh, to, to the tops of the mountains there uh, between the Euphrates and the, the Tigris where they stopped because Terah was not doing well. He was 250 years old, so he passed away there after a few years. And then once he was dead, uh, Lot and Abraham and Sarah, Abram and Sarai, Sarai uh, made the journey all the way down to Canaan, to the promised land. So he's sending them back to where they had spent uh, the previous uh, five years with Terah, the dad there, because everybody else in the family had stayed at that location. So <clears throat> the servant took 10 camels, lots of gifts, some other men, and he journeyed to the town of Nahor. This is what uh, they, we believe uh, he did is 550 miles up to this uh, place right here, Nahor, which is uh, the same as uh, Aram Naharim, uh, which is, means the land between the two rivers, which of course is between the Euphrates and the Tigris. So guidance is then requested and then <clears throat> Once he gets there, uh, the servant uh, gets to a place uh, where there's a well and he begins to pray. And he says this, he prayed, Lord, God of my master Abraham, make me successful today. Show me kindness, show kindness to my master Abraham. This, my master Abraham, my master uh, is repeated by the servant 22 times in chapter 24. This is the first time this shows up in the Bible at all. And in this chapter, chapter 24, the word servant shows up 22 times and is used. So it, this is a huge and important part of this whole story. And I'll kind of get into that at the end. <clears throat> and so now he's telling God where he is. He says, see, I'm standing behind, beside this spring, beside this well, beside this aquifer, okay? And the daughters of the townspeople, they will be coming out soon to draw water from the well because they all come out at the end of the day to draw the water for dinner and whatever, washing, etc. And then he says this, he says, uh, 
I, I'd like a sign from you that I found the right person. And it kind of reminds you of Gideon's fleece, okay? Uh, he says, may it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar so that I may have a drink, she said, and she will say, drink, and I'll water your camels too. So now you remember, he's got men with him and he's got not one, not two, but 10 camels that have been on a 550 mile trek. And camels apparently can drink a lot of water. And so this is a teenage girl and he says, this is gonna be a test for her, okay? If she says, if I ask her for a drink, she's gonna reply, okay, I'll give you a drink and I will get enough water for your camels. That's a big test. <clears throat> He says, okay, if she does that, then I'm asking that you would let her be the one that you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this sign, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. So while he was still praying, okay, while he was still praying, God answers his prayer. Before he had finished praying, Rebekah came out with her jar on her shoulder. Now she was the daughter of Bethuel, who is the son of Abraham's brother Nahor and his wife Milcah. So this makes Rebekah Isaac's second cousin. Now, at this point, uh, Abraham's family tree looks more like a family bush than a tree. So you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you see all of the brothers over here, uh, Haran, uh, Nahor, and you see Milcah and and. Bethuel, and then all of these others. And then, uh, of course, eventually it all results in the, the 12 children or the 12 men that become the 12 tribes of Israel. <clears throat> but nevertheless, kind of all in the family deal here. Uh, so the servant now sees Rebecca. And he's, when he puts eyes on her, he says, uh, the, he thinks to himself, the woman was very beautiful. And I don't know how she, he knew that she was a virgin, but she said, a virgin, no man had ever slept with her. And she went down to the spring, filled her jar, and then came back up again. So apparently this particular spring was more like an open well where she had to journey down into a pit. Uh, it probably had steps of some kind that she had to go down, dip her jar in the water, bring the water all the way back up. So this is gonna be quite the, ordeal for her to bring up enough water for 10 camels. So uh, the servant hurried to meet her and he said, please give me a little water from your jar. In part one of the request, she said, yes, drink my Lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. Then part two happened, which was the fulfillment of the, the whole request. Uh, after she had given the servant a drink, she said, look, I'll draw water for your camels too until they've had enough to drink. That's a lot of water. Mm -hmm. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water, back to the well, draw more water, back to the well, draw more water, back to the well. You get the point, okay? Uh, that's why the fact that the Muslims think this, this was a three-year-old girl is just kind of ridiculous. Uh, first of all, a three-year-old girl couldn't even hold a jar full, filled with water. So it's probably a teenage girl who is strong and has quite the endurance for, for being able to give water to all those camels and men. And then uh, Rebecca then introduces herself. <clears throat> she says, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Mil that Milcah bore to Naor. In other words, uh, Milcor is... Uh, Bethuel is my dad, and his mom and dad were Milcah and, and Nahor. Okay, Nahor was Abraham's brother. And she added, we have plenty of straw and fodder as well as room for you to spend the night. Now, this is after the servant gave her a, a gold ring for her nose and a bracelet for each arm. So uh, that was her reward for all that hard work that she'd done. Then the servant bowed down and he worshiped the Lord. He says, praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and his faithfulness to my master. So first thing he did after this happened was he praised God for answering the prayer and for making his mission successful. And he says, as for me, the Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. So he didn't have a GPS, didn't know the directions, and yet he was able, the Lord was able to lead him directly, not only to the right village, but to the right well at the right time 
to meet the right bride. So verses 28 through 54, we skip over, but let me kind of fill you in on what happens. The servant then goes in with his men and his camels and they kind of bed down for the night and they're about to eat dinner. But before they would eat dinner, the servant says, before I can eat, I have to tell you why I'm here. What, this is the background. This is the story of, of my mission. So he tells why he's there. He says, God's blessed my master, that's Abraham, with great wealth, but also with a son, Isaac. Abraham has sent me to his family to find a suitable bride for his son, Isaac. And then he explains how he prayed and how Rebekah fulfilled the exact terms of his prayer. And their, result, their response to this story was, what can we say? It's obvious that this mission, this whole thing is of God. So take Rebekah back to your master's son. Mission accomplished. But, verse 55, and we don't really get to see Laban in his full personality until what he does to Jacob with Rachel and Leah. But we can see a preview of Laban right here because he says this. He says, look, let her stay just a few days with us. But her brother Laban and her mother replied, let the young woman remain with us 10 days or so, then you may go. This is a delaying tactic in hopes that something else is going to happen, I'm sure. But the servant was wise to this. He says, no, it's clear. She is the right bride. It's time to go. He said to them, don't detain me. Now that the Lord has granted success to my journey, I want you to send me on my way so that I may go home to my master. Then they said, let's call Rebecca in and ask her. So they call Rebecca and they ask her, will you go with this man? This is a big deal. It's one thing for Abraham to send the servant to get a bride for Isaac that Isaac has never met. That's a leap, especially for us in our culture today. It's another leap for her father, mother, for Rebecca's father and mother and brother to just say, okay, fine, take her. But this is an important part of the story because Rebecca has to make the choice herself. Does she want to go? Will you go with this man? And her immediate response is, I will go. So, Verse 59, they sent their sister Rebecca on her way along with her nurse, Deborah. And Deborah, we know her name to be Deborah because of chapter 38 of Genesis because Deborah passes away in chapter 38 and she was described as Rebecca's nurse. And Abraham's servant and his men and the 10 camels, or at least some of the camels. So they give her a great blessing and they blessed Rebecca and they said to her, our sister, may you increase to thousands upon thousands. And she did. May your offspring possess the cities of their enemies. And they did. So that was the blessing. And that's the end of the story. So great story, a little unusual for our culture, but it has application to our lives as Christians. So let me walk you through what I think. First of all, there are two parts to the summary. Part one is the seeking of a good bride. And then part two, that's the mission. Part two is the servant that God commissions to go do it. And that's the need for a servant's heart. So the seeking of a good bride and the need for a servant's heart. Part of the seeking of the good bride is the avoiding the bad bride. Because remember, Abraham, do not allow him to marry somebody from Canaan. <clears throat> Well, Esau, who is Jacob's brother in chapter 26, uh, Rebecca, after 20 years of being barren, finally has twins. And now they're grown by chapter 26. And Esau goes and gets a wife at the age of 40. And Jacob, of course, still doesn't have one. Uh, so here's what happens with Esau. Esau and Jacob, the story of bad wives and a good wife important. Chapter 26, 34, and 35. When Esau was 40 years old, he married two Hittite women. 
And they were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebekah. It gets worse. Verse 27, or chapter 27, verse 46. This is Rebekah talking to her husband, Isaac. I am disgusted with living because of these Hittite women that Esau is married to. If Jacob, on the other hand, takes a wife from among the women of this land, from Hittite women like Esau did, then my life will not be worth living. Bad bride. So Esau being a little slow to figure things out, uh, in chapter 28, verse 6, he, Isaac had blessed Jacob and had sent him back to the same place that Rebekah was from, because that's he wound up living with her brother, Laban. And he sent him to Padam Aram to take a wife from there. And because he didn't want Jacob, because Rebekah was clear, no more Canaanite wives for my sons. So, and that he blessed him, that's Jacob. He commanded him, do not marry a Canaanite woman. Message clear. So, and that Jacob had obeyed his father and mother and had gone to Paddan Aram. And then verse eight, Esau, the light bulb comes on. Esau then realized how displeasing the Canaanite women were to his father, Isaac, and also to his mother, Rebecca. Esau is just a little slow on the uptake there. Bad brides yield difficult relationships, but good brides, a good bride. And that's really where this story goes from being a wonderful, interesting, unusual, bizarre kind of story into, I think, an allegory. So let's take a look at the pieces of the allegory. Allegory is kind of like a parable, okay, where the characters are really playing, playing to a different meaning. So let's take a look. Abraham represents in this story the father, that would be God, and Isaac, his only son, that would be Jesus. So remember, this is going to be an allegory. Abraham then sends a servant, in my opinion, that's us, to find and retrieve a good bride for Isaac. Okay, so Isaac needs a bride. Jesus needs a bride. The bride must come willingly, and she must leave her old life behind. The good bride, at least to the groom, is beautiful, pure, trusting, and has a servant's heart. Now, you may think that when I put this together, that that was a stretch, that this allegory probably is a little difficult to put A and B together. And you're, you're kind of right. It's, it's pretty deep. As a matter of fact, it's kind of deep like a well. So, well, let's take a deeper look. It's a deep subject. It not it interesting that we find that Rebecca, the bride, the good bride, is discovered at a well. And a well, the definition of a Hebrew word well is a pit. So Rachel is found in the pit. I mean, Rebecca. Fast forward a generation and Rachel, who then becomes Jacob's wife, is discovered at a well. Fast forward several hundred years and Moses finds Zipporah at a well. Interesting, huh? Lots of brides are being found at lots of wells here. And then we get to the, probably the most famous bride. We find a woman of Samaria, of all places, at Jacob's well, drawing water. And when she gives water to Jesus, Jesus says, if you ask me, I will give you water and you'll never thirst again. And she said, I've heard that the Messiah is coming. And Jesus said, for the first time, to a Samaritan, I am the Messiah. She became, and so did the people in the village, the first members, Gentile members, that were the bride of Christ. And where did he meet her? At the same well. So I think the allegory fits. Second part of this summary is 
the need for a servant's heart. It's not only necessary, it's absolutely required. And it's highly valued by not only Abraham, but by God. Eleazar is Abraham's oldest servant. And throughout this whole entire story, he never thinks once about himself. He only thinks about Abraham and Isaac. My master Abraham, 22 times. And when he was told, when he was asked to go, he didn't hesitate. He knew exactly what he needed to take, and he went. Rebecca provides water for Eleazar, 10 camels, and all the other men. When asked to go back to a foreign country and leave her family, she went. Not only did Eleazar have the heart of a servant, but Rebecca, the bride of Isaac, also had the heart of a servant. Two things. Good wife, bad wife. Good bride, bad bride. Heart of a servant. How do we apply this today in our lives? Well, there are actually two applications, not three. You have to change that. Number one, choosing godly people for our lives. And number two, developing a servant's heart. So the, pra the problem with Canaanite spouses, in other words, the problem with bad people in our lives is this. Don't intermarry. This is Deuteronomy 7. Don't intermarry with these Canaanites because don't give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. Why? Simple reason. They will turn your children away from following me and to serve other gods. And that's exactly what happened to the children of Israel. So good bride, bad bride, stay away from people who are not believers in terms of relationships because they will simply distract you from the mission that God has for your life. They'll drag you away. It's not good. Paul explains it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, don't be yoked together with unbelievers. So, and he gives a lot of examples here. He says, so what, what do righteous people have to do with wicked people? What does righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? It can't. What harmony is there between Christ and the worthless devil, Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and the temple of idols? Paul makes a concrete case here for not getting in a covenant relationship with an unbeliever if you're a believer. And that goes, of course, with, for marriage. It goes uh, for business relationships. It goes with, with serious friendships. Don't get yoked with people who are unbelievers because you will get pulled away. You'll get distracted and they'll teach your children about other gods. So now... What if it's too late? Uh, most of us have already chosen, at least, and in my case, we've already chosen our spouse. And what happens if our spouse, we thought they were a Christian, they turned out not to be, or what happens if we married someone who wasn't a Christian and they're still not a Christian? What do we do? Well, Paul addresses that because this was the early church and when people came, became believers, they didn't often become believers as a couple. They just, one became a believer and then maybe the second one did, but maybe they didn't. So Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7, to the rest of you, I say this, I not the Lord. If any brother that's Christian has a wife who isn't a believer and she's willing to live with him, that brother should not divorce the unbelieving wife. And if a woman has a husband who's not a believer and and uh, he's willing to live with her, then she must not divorce him. So Paul says, whatever situation you find yourself in, and, and you need to stay in that situation. And it may be hard. It's not God's best. It's not going to be the easiest. It's going to be a struggle. And you're going to have difficult times because you're not equally yoked. But nevertheless, stay in that relationship. And he goes on to say, who knows, perhaps by your life, uh, they will be one. So... If you happen to be in a situation where you've made a, a choice not to be with someone in a relationship uh, that's a believer, then uh, Paul says you're just going to have to have to see it out, see it through, if, if they want to see it through. So servants in search of a good bride, Matthew chapter 28. That, this is where the allegory comes down to us. We're the servants that have been commissioned to go find the bride of Christ. 
Now, God is truly going to send an angel ahead and provide this bride, but we're, we have the task of taking the camels and going and looking, okay? That's our job, but don't be, don't be deceived that, that God is going to choose his bride. The Holy Spirit is going to be there and make that choice, but here's what we've got to do. We've got to go and make disciples of all nations. We've got to go with the camels and go looking for the bride in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to obey everything. And Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says it uh, in a little bit different. He says, you will receive power from the Holy Spirit who come, when he comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. That means messengers, okay? Servants in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Good bride, bad bride. We're looking for Christ's bride. We're looking for people who will become Believers who will place their faith in Christ and become part of this family that we call the bride or the church. Jesus is taught that the last shall be first. And he's taught, he washed feet. And right after he washed their feet, he says this to his disciples, no servant is greater than his master. No messenger is greater than the one who sent him. So we are servants just like the, the servant of Abraham was. We have a job to do, and that is the same as his job. We've got to go looking for the bride of Christ. As Christians, we do not remain in the world to be simply there to satisfy ourselves. We, we're, we're here with a job to do, just like Abraham's servant had a job to do. We are servants of the Most High God, and we're servants, as Paul says, of the gospel message. Our job is then to believe it, to live it, and to tell it. And that's why we're here. Jesus gives us clean and pretty feet. Remember, he just washed the disciples' feet. And Isaiah 52 says this, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring the gospel, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. So from that perspective, we go and we tell it on the mountain. But like Eleazar, and like Jacob, and like Moses, and like Jesus, we're probably going to find the bride in the pit of the well, looking for water. So let's go there. There's a good bride to be found. In Jesus' name. Pray with me. Father, Thank you for this story. It's a great story, but it's great motivation too. Father, we know we've been commissioned, and yet sometimes all we seem to do is care about what our own needs are. Help us to set that aside and be as concerned about you, more concerned about you, our master, than we are about anything that we personally need. You are truly a loving father a holy God, and you've given us a tremendous job. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, that's the story of how Isaac found Rebecca. So until next week, stay well. Know that we love you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.